Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Knowles. I'm one of the founders of GovDirections, and we are here today at GovSchool to talk about um, the requests for proposals, how to learn to read and, and the, those, those documents and to understand sort of the codes and the keys and other types of information you need in order to be successful in responding to those. This is a GovSchool series of GovDirections. And just as a reminder, you can find us online at GovDirections.com. We've been in, in this marketplace since 1998, and our primary purpose is to deliver, uh, retrieve first, and then deliver um, those contracts that you're, you're monitoring in the local, federal, state, and federal government sector. I always refer back to this diagram or illustration of sort of how we, um, what, what our purpose is in this process. Uh, most of us, when we first come to um, the marketplace, we're familiar with the federal government. I then quickly realize there is a heck of a lot of state and local governments that we can, um, can be successful winning contracts. And so there's over 35,000 plus cities and towns, over 3,000 counties, 12,000 plus schools. In fact, I would probably guess that number is a little low now, probably close, closer to 14 to 15,000 in different types of school related activities in the K through 12 environment that we, we've now entered into in the United States to help educate our children. And then we have over 39,000, closer to 40,000 special districts. We like to use special districts to deliver access to um, to help control that uh, flow of spending at the localized level. Oftentimes those agencies will include um, supervision or, or boards that include other governments, for example, to provide hospital service, airports, parks, recreation systems, transit systems, and so forth, uh, but a combination, but all with the ability to procure and issue these documents. They're called requests for proposals. And so as they do issue those, some 5,000 documents issued daily come in a lot of different forms. You know, the one we're gonna talk about today are commonly referred to the RFP. Um, and, uh, but we also see out there the invitation to bid, the ITB. We also say invitation to quote, ITQs. Uh, sometimes we'll see RFIs, requests for information. All of those have different uh, meanings and in, in processes that are required in order to have you respond. And each of those are, ex are explained. Well, the number one tip I always give our members is, is when you reply to a government request, uh, you want to really focus in on um, what they're telling you. You know, you, this is not the time to be creative. They want to give you exactly what they need in their responses uh, for their documents. So you want to focus in on that and only give them that information they really need. Now, and the reason why is because they're really at the first stage, making sure you're crossing your eyes and, uh, excuse me, crossing your T's and dotting your I's. I need to take a cup of coffee. I haven't even had my first one yet. Um, and you will, um, in your primary purpose is to get by that procurement officer. And, and, and then when you fairly get into the door, then you can be a little bit more creative and you're working and negotiating and given, uh, you know, more of a traditional business relationship where you're, you're really are providing the service or supplies that they need um, at the level that they're requiring. And so I just always follow those, those, um, those requirements that you find in those documents is very important. And so what I'm gonna kind of do today as we walk through this um, is I'm gonna pull out some real live documents. In fact, there's one that caught my attention the other day. I've really been in this market segment some, some 30 years and, and um, I do some consulting work in classification compensation management for local governments. It's what I was really trained to do um, in, with my degrees. And, I, and so I continue to do that maybe a couple of projects a year, but there's one that came out just the other day that caught my attention. I'm going to use that as a, as a, as a process because you really want to focus in when you're looking at RFPs, you want to define what your marketplace is. Okay. If, for example, in my situation, I'm trying to, I'm probably looking at to work with local governments that are population size, maybe between 10,000 and 30 to 40,000, nothing too large, nothing too small. Um, and, and then I'm really probably looking in a particular area, maybe the Southeast, so I'm really focused in on those. And when I pinpoint that opportunity, I will have more success. It doesn't really do me any good to really just go out there and try to do business with New York City. I don't have the skills or, or, or the, the capacity to do that. So I don't really mess with those. Now you may have that. So, and I'm not, for example, in classification, I'm not really interested in California. So I'm just gonna bypass that. But so we're here in Georgia and there's a couple of them that are actually out. And so here's one for do October 28th. Now in our system, whenever you first click into it, of course you have to be authenticated. And I'm going to use a demo account for you. When it pulls up, it's going to give you some basic information. It's going to give you a, a job 
title or a bid title. It's going to give me the ability to save it, which I'm going to go ahead and do because I want to come back to it a little bit later. It's important to be able to do that. Okay. And, um, and just remember the chat session is available. So if you do have questions, feel free to ask those questions in there and you can actually give me a little uh, affirmation as we go along to make sure you're hearing me okay and this is working out for you in a, in a grand scale. Uh, but here, here we are, then we're actually gonna give me a URL information where I can find it online. And, um, and you can see the event date as well as the county that is the agency sponsor. And, um, and a reference number, I may have to call them or something as a phone number. So I wanna look at that reference number and we're also gonna give you a summary about the, the contract. And this is called my attention. Uh, this is something I'm, I'm interested in. I'm able to provide the service and, and there's always a special note. So if we think there's something that you need to know in order to win that contract, we're gonna tell you here. A lot of times it's, they may be using a third party service provider and we'll explain to you how to bypass that. Okay. And then, you know, maybe some of you may not be familiar with FAM County's at, uh, I do, I am. So, but uh, let me look at very close to my, where I grew up. So that's another interesting part of the contract. So it's, it's a place I really want to go to. Um, and so I can scale out and look and see that Effingham is in Springfield and it's just outside Savannah. And look, I'm actually from right down here in Brunswick, Georgia. That's where we actually have another office too. So it's not home. I probably could get home and see some family members if I win that contract. Just another reason to go after it. Um, and so when it, so then so it's caught my attention. I'm interested. And so what I want to do is click on there and go directly to that website in order to um, to learn more about Effingham County and then to actually get in there and to see that particular listing. Now that would want me to register as a vendor or log into my account to gain some access. And so I might want to do that when I first come to it. Um, but let me just make sure this is something I'm really interested in. So here's the, the listing. And this is one of the third party providers. It's freely available and they may want me to register. I don't have to register um, unless they really require it when I get in there. You know, and then I don't want to be what we call bidwinked. And that is that, you know, suggest that you don't have to pay, pay for access to public information when in fact it's not required. So I'm able to click on it. Look, there it is. So here's the document. And I haven't had to register yet. I haven't had to pay anything. Although they've already suggested that I had to. Give me some details, it's here. Now, if you get here, there's some question you, you might have that about technically, you can contact us, we'll try to help you. But at this point, if I've got a question about this RFP, I'm gonna to wanna to call Miss um, Bruton. I assume that's how you say her name, and her email. There are emailer, but I'm not gonna call anyone else. That's sort of the first rule, okay? Follow the instructions on how you respond to them. If I should call the county manager, who I might know, that's I've been in Georgia and I've been here for a while, that could disqualify me, okay? So I don't wanna do that, okay? I wanna make sure I'm following the instructions. They've got a real live RFP on the table, and so they're under specific rules that they have to follow. So I'm not going to contact the county commissioners. I'm not going to contact the finance director. I'm going to, if I have a question, I'm going to contact Allison. Okay. And so that's the first rule and kind of read through it. And there's going to be a pre-bid meeting on 930, 930. Does it? So this actually says no, not mandatory. Now the truth of the matter is if I'm interested in this project, I want to probably show up for that pre-bid meeting. Okay. It's at five o'clock. Most of these are now online. You know, they're going to move into this Zoom casting and so forth. So I can, I'm going to show my interest. But when I do show my interest, I'm still going to follow the rules. I'm going to, if I have questions, she probably would tell me how to actually ask questions. But, but let's just kind of move through because I'm definitely interested now. And I'm going to learn a little bit more about this. So as I open that up, it will download onto my desktop. And so give me just a second. We're going through and we're learning this as we go along here. Got that here. Let's see my downloads here. I'm opening it and now I'm going to do additional screen share for you because it's downloaded in Acrobat. As you know, nowadays everything's pretty much in, in Adobe and, and you're able to download these very quick documents. Now, when I first started this, it literally, once I hear about it, it was probably about, I only got five or six days left to bid on it. Then they will have to snail mail it to me and by the time I get it, it just isn't something I can respond to. And then as we moved into the fax age, they used to allow us to fax it around. And now those, it's right here at my fingertips. I'm so grateful that we've been able to do that. And so that's one reason why we have the ability to send you five, thousands and thousands of bids each and every day. And so here we go. I've got a, 
remember that number there. That's how I'm going to refer to, to this particular proposal as I go along. And, um, and then it's going to be a document title with a document page. And so you, you start looking, when you start actually looking at the RFP, um, you come to a point where you, you see this traditional, more standard um, parts of that, okay? And um, in all, the parts of an RFP um, that you will find is, let's just kind of, I've got a little slideshow. You typically see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do one more switch for us, and I'm going to come back to the original document. But I've got a slideshow that you can find in our EcGov school in our, in our document database. Um, and so here in, in this particular slide, for, there shows you the, the standard parts of any RFP. Okay, here's the statement of work, technical specifications, a schedule, a list of deliverables, contract terms and conditions, the format of proposal, the qualification and experience, cost breakdown and evaluation criteria. Now, just as a reminder, let's keep that, those um, uh, mute statuses on. And if you don't have yours, just check real quick, make sure you're in a mute status. If you do have a question, ask the question by raising your hand and that'll help me be able to control that okay so you know so that these are the parts of an rfp and you know just as a reminder if it, it's it's supposed to be hard if it were easy everyone would do it okay this is from tom hanks he's from in a league of their own so i always like to refer back to that but you you'll see these standard parts for any rfp once you see one you'll see them all and so as you get prepared to respond before you even Go out there and look. You might want to go ahead and, and really kind of give a statement, like a capability statement about who you are and about what you do and how you will respond to a typical uh, contract. And you're going to have that stored somewhere. You're going to use that in a template. And then you're going to have your, your, your methodology of providing your services, the technical specifications. And then you're going to have a schedule already developed. Most of my work is done in a four-month cycle. And I'm going to have that down where I know what I'm going to tell them. And it's going to be the same for every one of them. I have to, I'm going to have to modify my schedule to whatever this organization requests. And then the, the standard list of deliverables, my capabilities, what I'm able to do, I'm going to have it already set up. And I might grow that over time. So sometimes I do staffing analysis. Sometimes I do purely compensation study. Sometimes I may go in and do an organizational analysis. So each of those three areas of my specialty, I'll have a document, or maybe a paragraph or two, that kind of explain how that works. And then I'm going to drop that in if, it's, if this one is looking for also staffing experience or deliverable for that. Okay, we'll find that out in just a second. Contract terms and conditions. I will always have a standard contract ready to go, and I will submit it in my RFP unless they have, an R, they have a contract already written. And most times in a request for proposal, they'll have that. And you, and tr traditionally, you have to agree to that. So don't, you know, what you want to want to do is just to drop in that contract. If they don't have one, then go ahead and propose yours. And that sometimes will help you in your, in your um, RFP response. And then they're going to give me a format. And I, I would venture to say that most of my RFPs I respond to have the exact same format, okay, and request. Because they, you know, the, the truth of the matter is procurement officers are trained by the same groups. And in fact, I teach a course at the University of Georgia on the, on, you know, the bidding and contracting, and that's what we do. I teach them how to write an RFP. So everyone who's in this business um, is taught the same way. So you're going to see that same thing over and over and over again. So you just, once you do one, you just keep it, you store it, and you're able to respond to it. Qualifications and experience. Um, I'm going to have that. I have, you already have your, um, your Vita somewhere. You're going to broken down. You're going to have it maybe in a, a paragraph format. Um, in your experience, you want to always keep it updated. And in this case here, what I'm going to try to do, since this is in, in South Georgia, I would probably go in and give them some experience of other counties around the area. In fact, I probably have worked in most counties in Georgia in 30 years. So um, this is my backyard, so I, that's to kind of be expected. Um, so I can pull out some solid experience um, showing them that I know what I'm doing in this field. And then a cost breakdown, I'm going to kind of have in my, in my back pocket uh, a, a methodology for giving them a cost. Now, they're going to tell me how they want me to respond to them. They may say, would they want the travel separate? They want the number of hours on it. How many, if you want to have any subcontractors, they might give me a breakdown. But I'm going to, before I go into it, I'm going to kind of know that I'm going to give them an indicator. I'm going to ask them some questions like, in my business, number of employees. How many employees do you actually have in your organization? I'm going to find some indicators that are common. Okay? And then before I give my final pro proposal, I'm going to go out there and do some spin research. We explained that in one of the sessions. We actually did that yesterday afternoon, in fact. Um, but spin research to go in and say, on average, this is what folks are bidding in my field. OK, 
Okay. And if I know that this is probably not going to have a great many people responding, it's a smaller project. So I might want to increase that a little bit. If I know it's very competitive, I may want to decrease that some. So you're going to stay within a, a probably a standard deviation of about, excuse me, <clears throat> about two so that you don't actually get too far out of it. And that's some ways to think about it is like, you don't want to be more than 20% below where the market's at. You don't be, want to be more than 20% ahead of where the market is at. If it's a little bit less competitive, maybe you want to get, be, be in that zero to 20% high rate. If you know it's very competitive and you want that deal, you may want to be in that zero to 20, negative 20% in order to really win that contract, okay? It's sometimes it's worthwhile to do that. And then they're gonna tell me an evaluation criteria and that criteria is going to um, drive um, my response as well. So if they're giving so many points for certain parts of that, then I'm gonna focus in on that and make sure I, I, uh, I'm able to um, w get all the points that are possible for that evaluation. In fact, before I submit this proposal, I'm gonna sit, sit at home, I might bring my daughter in, my wife in, and and pitch it and give, you know, basically a, a number of them to and then say, can you, can you grade me based on this evaluation criteria? And the truth of the matter is what you get in a, a setting like that is probably very close to what you'll get in the public environment because the people who are evaluating this are going to be maybe the police chief or the fire chief or the, or the sheriff. And they, they don't have a great deal of experience in evaluating RFPs or basically evaluating you. Okay. In that process. So you'll get a very common, and in fact, you probably will get lower scores from your friends than you would in, a, in an environment. So it's a worthwhile exercise. So let's go back and see if, if this RFP follows those parts. And pulling it back up here. Thank goodness for Zoom and all these tools. We're actually getting to be somewhat of an expert at it. So as I go through, and so I've got this here, I've got all these windows open up on my screen, so I've got a clear it up a little bit so I can see the document. Um, the first part's gonna be that explanation and we'll give some details. And then on, on the front cover, they're gonna tell me exactly where I need to respond, almost always. So here, I'm gonna remember that. This is where I've gotta have it shipped to. I'm gonna make sure I give myself enough time. I'm not gonna send it too soon though, okay? I don't wanna be there a week ahead of time because things tend to happen and somebody can see my proposal. So we're gonna we give them a little bit of, uh, uh, only a little bit of window. Maybe I'm gonna get there the day before and I'm gonna have it delivered by, FedEx, okay, and um, and make sure that it gets there with a certified requ required. Now in the winter time, uh, there might be some icing and snow, and I'm not going to get it there three or four days ahead of time. Okay, so so you want to make sure. Now a lot of these nowadays, you're going to be able to email it. Let's see if they're going to allow us. To, oh, look at there, they're going to. It may even let us email it, so we can get it to them and send it to and send it to them in, the, in a closed system, a, a confidentially required system as as you might have. They will give me a, a standard opening letter, so they've met sort of the purpose as we discussed there in the booklet the various um, parts of it. And then and in this here, they're gonna probably lay out everything I really need to know in one, in one page, okay? And how to respond to them and where I need to get it to and what time I need to have it at. So if it says 11 a.m., don't get it there at 11.30, okay? Which is when you book FedEx, you say, you know, deliver before 11, so make sure um, if that's the way they want it to have there because 11.01, you're gonna be disqualified. And, you know, we don't want to get it there on October the 1st because they're going to have some addendums, most likely. So you maybe, if I was uh, responding to this, I'm going to get it there by October 27th, probably about 11 a.m. on October 27th. I'll make sure. And then if it's not delivered in time, I might be able to just drive that there and drop it off. Okay. And then they're also going to just always put that disclaimer. And they, if they don't like you, they may not hire you. Okay, basically, it's very rarely that's used. I just need to, you know, when we saw the situation with um, COVID initially, we had, had a couple of contracts on the table, and those board of commissioners said, "We don't, we're not quite sure what's happening right now. We're putting those contracts off, so they don't, they have, they keep that there for that particular reason." Um, but then they've all called back and said, "Yeah, we're doing it, doing it," but got back on track. And in this one, there is going to be a meeting, but it's not mandatory. But if you want, if you're interested in submitting a bid, these are the things you got to catch on. You have to tell her, tell this person before 5 p.m. on the September 30th. Okay, so they, they got to know before you actually submit the bid, you got to um, let them know you're going to. So watch for those little things that are sometimes will catch you and, you and you may have missed that thinking that deadline was the 28th when it really, the real deadline is September 30th. To let them know because if you don't tell them then you can't even respond on the 28th. And then any questions, they're going to have a question and answer time. 
you know, what you're going to do is well, you're going to hold all your questions until, you know, right, right before, and you're going to send them as they instruct you in the email, and then you wait, and then everybody's going to get the same answers back, and they'll have that document there in an addendum, and then most likely they're going to say in here somewhere that you've got to send it in the form of an addendum. There it is right there. Um, they're going to tell you this, that you have to certify that you've read the addendum, and that note, and that means that you've you've um, you've done you've done your extra. They've explained to you the, the differences that may occur from the RFP initially to when that the actual um, um, questions are answered. Okay, so that's very important. I've had I had a client really lose. I would think probably about a seven to ten million dollar deal because they failed to sign the addendum on the return document that they read a, a, a an amendment to the the um to the contract because it was a requirement okay you don't want to lose a contract based on something like that so make sure now here they're going to give you a document checklist this is actually an added feature I'm not always there in in, um, in rfp so they want to give you something that you can just check off because they want you to win this governments really won't want to do business with you so they're going to make it easy that you've looked at everything and then you um, and you looked over and, and they were reminding that you you You've done this, and not only that, they're going to require you to sign it and send it back. Now, you know, you would think, uh, you know, I, if I forget this, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. You've got to do exactly what they tell you to do. You've got to read through these. You've got to sign off on it, and then you just got to check off that you've done it. Okay, even if you don't have sub sub consultants, you still got to check off that you that you've read that that information and that you've completed it in a document that says I do not have sub consultants. So you want to speak to those specifically, and um, and they have those there, and then you're going to sign that and put it as a part of it. So then we step into the real parts of the the RFP as a, as we've instructed people over time, and so let's see how well this student has done. And you've got a purpose, okay? It's clear, a clear purpose. Clarity of language is very important when you respond to a request for proposal, and you need to have a clear purpose, okay? Um, and your response as well, okay? In fact, when I, I write proposals, what I do is in response, I would say, the purpose of my response is to provide you uh, the services that you're seeking as described here, and then use the language that they're using, okay? Build your, your response based on um, their expectations. Always do that, you'll have more success. And then they're going to tell you how to submit a proposal. They want it in a sealed, opaque package. So don't send it in a clear package. I think opaque means it's darker, so they can't see it in, inside. Somebody can help me with that, that definition there. But um, yeah, so they don't, they want it sealed and so no one can see the, the, the contents, okay? And they want it plainly marked on the outside, RFP number and title, date and time of submission and company name. Now, you know, maybe you put your name and return address or something. They don't want that. They want this specifically. So they're going to tell you what they want and then you're going to have to respond. These are reasons for them to disqualify you, okay? Don't give them a reason to that, to that. Email or deliver in sufficient time to ensure Okay, got to have it there. So it is going to be mailed. And then you can check, you've got to check on your own prior to the final submission to make sure there's no additional addendums. So once I've got this one saved and I know the date, then I'm going to check before I send my package off to make sure. And if they actually put something up there in the last day or so, they're going to give you a little bit more time. Still catch that. And if you might have to fax them a, 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 another addendum and say, add this to my RFP. Okay, or they'll give you some instructions for that. And then the proposal is not received by the time and date will not be opened or considered. Okay, so they, they just, that's one again, that's just qualifiers. You got to get it there by, with instructions. And then if you have an objection later on, they're going to go ahead and tell you ahead of time if you can object or not. If there's an error, they're going to explain to you. And they, and they also give you some standards for acceptance of vendors for contract award. Okay, and so basically here, they're just going to say, you know, more standard language. You're going to see this. If you're in Georgia and you're responding to Georgia, you're going to see the same language in most of the RFPs. And these are parts that have just become, a, a, you know, important to them to make sure they, they clarify. And, you know, always there's some sort of state legislative requirements that are dropping in and you want to make sure that you meet that. Okay. And most of us do, but those are more standards. So don't let those, those, those parts scare you off or anything. These are standard contract languages within an RFP. They're just telling you that, that you won't have to agree to this before they can hire you. And then we jump into the schedule of activities and how they're going to make their decision. Okay. And they're going to tell you that the bidding contract is going to be sent to the board of commissioners. They don't know exactly when, but it's going to be pretty soon after that date. Okay. They're going to give some dates when they there, but once you get it in, um, what I would start doing 
is I would start monitoring the agenda, and I'll show you how to do that for this particular agency, um, uh, before uh, maybe about you know two weeks after that. And then, I, and then I'm gonna learn who's winning. If I haven't heard from them, then I'm gonna learn who's winning that. And then I'm gonna take that and understand why I didn't win, okay? I'm gonna use that in my research. But hopefully I'm gonna get a call probably within the week after, the week after, and then they were probably gonna take the top two, three respondents, and then they're gonna probably interview them. And there's, that's when I'm gonna say, yeah, I know what you requested in RFP, but you know, I also have these other services that I can share with you or I can offer you. And this is what I think would, be, would add to your project, okay? I'm gonna be able to do what you expect, but I also have some other ideas for you, okay? And then they're gonna give you some general um, conditions. These are going to be more Pacific in Georgia. They'll be very common. If you're in Texas, you'll have those others. Um, you can't do multiple proposals. So there's no patent and so forth. Um, and then they also want to see if you award the contract, then they will, they may actually be able to, um, to um, negotiate with you by what they want to say. They may have the, you might be able to, even though you all have bid, we all re are responded in a way, we may still negotiate with the ones we select. Okay. And, um, and also they're always going to give that ability. You can't, bond governments, you know, um, and, uh, and they will give you the contract terms. They will tell you that ahead of time. And then insurance, always pay attention to the insurance provisions. Most of us um, have these. Now, if you don't have it, and let's just say, you know, here they want a $1 million bodily injury for commercial general liability, and yours is a $500,000 policy. Well, you could go and call your insurance company and potentially say, if I win this contract, then I want to have this insurance, and typically your insurance provider can give you that information so that you can submit that and say, yes, if this person uh, wins the contract, then they'll be have, they'll have the coverage. Okay. And I'll have it affected it. And, but if you already have it, say, I already have it. If you don't have it then you can say, I will have it. Okay. I wouldn't probably go and invest in it until I win the contract. Okay. But I'd say, yes, I'd be able to do all this. Okay. Now, if I really know I've got a great shot and I have a good shot at this one, if I didn't have that insurance requirement, I might go ahead and say, you know, I'm in business. I need to have that minimum level. Cause you're going to see that very common among organizations across the board, okay? And they will talk about how they, they will be covered there. This is more the, the, the um, sort of the purpose of it still when we're looking at it and, and the contract. And this is really more, still more the, the actual contract. And then they would say they want a signed response. I had another customer, they internally, they did their RFP, sent it up to the executive for signature. The executive read it, didn't realize they needed a signature, sent it off, disqualified. Don't let that happen, okay? Pay attention to these minor details. Payment, they're gonna tell you, everybody's asking, how am I gonna get paid when I get this, okay? And here, they're always gonna to speak to that, um, but basically they're telling you that, yeah, we're not quite sure how we're gonna pay you on this contract, because I'm gonna tell them up front, probably in my proposal, that um, you know I want 30% at, at closing, and I want to, at the delivery of the main product, I want another 30%, and then the final day, I'll have the, the remaining portion. Uh, there's going to be some sort of agreement. If they don't ask me for that, I'm, I'm going to wait until I get in the door and negotiate that with them. Okay. And um, that's part of the, the proposal back to them. Okay. But most of them in a, in a consulting relationship, they're going to give you uh, some money up front when they close with you. And then um, if it's a supplier product, typically whenever you deliver. Okay. And then the, the document here, how I sign it and move forward. And then I'm going to get into sort of the, um, the yeah, section three, which basically describes the work product and what I have to the, the deliverable, if you remember, and what I have to do. Okay. Okay, so here we have the um, description and objectives. Okay, the um, fee proposal, proposal deadline, withdrawal. Can you go on here in details? The criteria they're going to use to determine the responsibility of each proposal. Do they have an understanding? Can the proposal uh, deal with the responsibilities? Have they had past success? Have you declared bankruptcy? So they're going to tell you that. And then they will give you their qualification evaluation criteria. Okay. All submittals are evaluated in this method, 20% that you put some thought into your proposal. Okay. Related experience, 20%. Very important. Now, if, if I'm very new to government and I have, I'm not really contracting just yet, I might have some private sector experience or maybe I experience working for someone else, then um, I would put that in there instead. Okay, drives, don't just leave that blank. That's such a big percentage. Um, but if I have 
if I have a lot of experience and I'm going to really focus in on those, those areas that are close to them or similar in size to them, there's some qualifier that I'm able to, to drive to them. Okay. Um, reference credentials and recommendations for past clients. So you're looking to 35% is going to be historical um, um, performance. Okay important so i know that now so if i'm brand new i gotta I realize this is probably going to be a long shot because they're putting so much emphasis on past performance not that i'm not going to go for it but um but that's a big i just got to understand i might, may not win this one okay and then the cost associated with developing preparing and presenting the study okay and so that's the cost is only 25 percent. so 75 percent other stuff 25 percent cost okay so if i if i do realize that i'm Lower here, I may want to lower my price, okay? But if I know I've got this locked in, then, and that's such a big percentage, I may want to raise my price a little bit, okay? Um, the ability of the firm and firm subcontractors to provide the services requested as, um, you, as you have financial stability. So, you know, that's, those right there, those one, two, or um, two, 40% is just sort of up in the air. Those are quality and thoughtfulness. What the heck does that mean, you know? And then most of us have had financial stability, and who's going to determine that? Um, so those are those sort of give me points right there. So I'm really looking and focusing in on this these other parts, okay? Because I know I'm going to have a good quality proposal, and then they're going to be made by a selection committee. So this is where I'm going to practice my proposal, get it in front of some folks, and have them score me using these points, and then this, they'll they'll probably score it very similar to what we have for others. And then the format of the response, they're going to tell me exactly how they. They want me to prepare it, and I'm going to follow that. So in section A, I'm going to have a section A on my response. I'm going to talk about agents. Section B, I'm going to talk about my statement of methods. Okay. Section C, my management synopsis. Section D, and so forth. Okay, I'm going to, my response back to them, I'm going to work it around. Most of this I'm going to have already somewhere. Remember, we're going to have some templates. But when I organize my response to them, I'm going to have A through G in a, in a little folder that I'm going to ship to them. And then, um, and then the cost, they want you actually, uh, they may ask me to ask, they may ask you to put the cost in a, a separate area or something. Make sure you watch that. Sometimes they want it in a separate folder and they don't open that until they look at everything else. Okay. So make sure you pay attention to that. And then if there's any special conditions, now most of these, I'm just going to browse through them real quick <clears throat> because those are um, going to be somewhat standard in um, how, to sub in how to terminate contracts and so forth. I'm not going to let it scare me away. This is standard language. But I'm going to be aware of it and read it, but it, most of us can live with that. And then I'm looking at the scope and classification. Here's the scope of work and how. And so in my methodology, I'm going to talk about this, these, the scope that they outline. Once again, it's probably in a paragraph form. So in my response, I'm going to say, my objective will be to help the county attract and retain qualified employees. And this is how I will do it. I will ensure positions performing similar work. This is how I will do it and so forth, but I'm gonna frame my response so that that person who's checking me off to begin with is literally just checking off that I've done everything that they've asked for, okay? And in, in this case here, I'm not gonna add seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Okay? It doesn't, I'll, if they're not asking for staffing analysis, I'm gonna go volunteer it. It doesn't do me any good. It's gonna hurt my proposal. I'm gonna focus on what they're asking for. Scope of services, once again, they're gonna list them. I'm gonna say in my response to them, here's what I'm gonna provide for you. One, two, three, four, five. Tell them how. And then they're gonna tell you about how many meetings. This is gonna be part of my pricing structure. So that I'm gonna to have to go on site, it looks like three times without really going into the details, um, but I will be able to, to meet those. And most of this nowadays can be done in any way I need to. <clears throat> the, the study itself, they give me some instructions. And in your, in your business, they'll tell you exactly what they need to do. Love this line right here, straightforward, easily understood, okay? So they won't, they won't you know, simple is as simple does. Okay? And so they're telling me the details. That's going to be part of my response always. Okay. And then my fee proposal. And then here they're going to help me. And in, in every industry, we're going to go in there and we're going to, they're going to tell me. So some of these might be by hour. Some of these might be fixed fees. Some of this, these might be mileage and so forth. In your industry, it'll make sense to you. Okay. And if it doesn't make sense, then you, you reach out to them. But it, sh it should make sense to you. This one here is Sure, it makes, it makes perfect sense to me. I'm going to be able to give them a, 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 a response. And then we're looking at some more, more standard attachments that you'll see that are probably required by law that you're not going to discriminate, you're not going to use drugs, 
and so forth. And this is going to be the standard ones. And that's, that's really your document. Okay. And, um, and then in, you know, see here, those attachments, each of those, you're going to want to go in there and actually um, pull those out. But those are your documents that you have to respond to. And so I'm getting um, some, we'll start with questions now. If you got some questions, I'm going to, um, I'm going to start answering those, but we have one that says some, and here's a sample contract. They threw one in. If I get a sample contract, I got to make sure I live with it. Okay. And most of these I can, it's a standard typical one in Georgia. And so it's 38 pages. And when I opened that up, I might've been, I was thinking, goodness gracious, 38 pages for a small contract, but you can see most of this is pretty standard. It's not anything to scare me away. And so the question is that most some RPs don't list evaluation criteria. Um, do these percentages vary a lot for proposals or could we use these as a general benchmark? The answer to that question is, you know, it's very rare that an RFP does it. <coughs> if they don't assume that they're going to be looking at their um, low price, okay? the most effect the cost um, focus almost always on cost. Okay. Um, and your ability to perform, they're going to assume that you have that ability. Okay. And it's going to be based on cost. Um, I would I would think some of the widgets that are out there, widget type proposals, those are even for a lot of PPE contractors right now. They they basically just want your price, and that's how their evaluation is going to occur. Because they're going to give you very specific instructions if they don't give you an evaluation criteria. They're going to say, "We want this particular product, and here are the diameters of it, the specifications of it. You got to provide it, and we know if you don't, we're not going to take it. Uh, but everybody who's responding is going to agree to us in a uniform way." Now, an RFP like this, they're not going to be uniform. Okay, we're going to provide different different parts to it, and that's where you're going to almost always see the evaluation criteria. How about more questions? We're, com we're coming up on a on um, a mark that I, I usually don't get, we don't get too far forty minutes on this type of, of a session, but in um, others, to try not to get too deep. Um, any questions? Any final questions? Well, I want to thank you for spending your Monday morning talking about a request for proposal. And um, I would encourage you um, as, um, as you learn more about government contracting, that you pay attention to our Gov School series. And, um, and we will um, we continue to offer different ones. Join us this afternoon at our um, scheduled entrepreneur session. It's a very popular one. People really like that. Good motivator. And Professor Chris Saints will conduct that and help you with that. Um, if you're not currently a member, I always like to close by suggesting you become a member. We want you to. You can call us at 800-492-8523. And here are our services based on the level of coverage, number of states, and, um, and choose the one that's best for you. If you're not sure, uh, Dale would be glad to um, um, Dale would be glad to, to help you, or I will be, or whoever picks up the phone when you call. And I did. I promised you that I would share with you about the agenda. So let me, let me do that. Okay, because that's one way I watch how things are getting awarded. And I'm going to go back to this particular government, which was Effingham County, Georgia. When I initially come to a, a website um, um, for government, I'm going to look, well, I'm usually in the procurement office. Sometimes they'll put information directly there, but always in government, the decision-making process, and we talk about this in a particular um, session, is um, in, in a public setting. So most of us can follow along and learn. It's always in the agenda. Before government makes a decision, they're talking about it. They're planning to talk about it. Um, and then they're going to they're come up. So here's a September 15th commission meeting. And let me just open one up. And so what I want to do is I'm going to monitor those. And, and this, the, the minutes aren't there yet, um, but the agenda is there. Okay. I'm going to open it up, HTML. And so they have a short agenda, it looks like. And okay. here's the meeting agenda final agenda, and then the agenda materials. So let's look at the agenda. So they're going to come together at five. They will have a discussion, details. Let's see here. Then we'll get to some business. This, they're actually adopting their budget. Um, I might be interested in listening to that because they're going to tell me how much they plan on spending on that project in the budget. We go in, and there's the change orders. Uh, but here's where you would find contracts, okay? Revised purchase and sell. One of, so these are contracts. They'll talk about them. And this is where you will find the awards for a particular project. Okay. And, um, and so you're going to watch for those. When you see a, an, an item like the budget, they're planning on having a, probably a very full agenda. 
and they may not talk about contracts at that. So they might be waiting on some, um, but there's there, this is where you define that information. So, you know, just to give you another example, and let's just, just pick one at random here from a previous meeting, commission meeting in July. You know, the truth of the matter is, um, let's see, the COVID's caused a lot of our public meetings. I have a little bit of an issue, but in a more traditional sense here, they'll, they'll tell you who's there and they'll talk about um, the minutes, the correspondence in detail. And most of this is in the consent agenda. And so here they want to tell some details as well. So if there's a contract approval, let me see if I can find one here. Here's a contract here, okay? So they'll tell you the details. Five bids were received. They gave it to McClendon Enterprise. The low bidder was this amount. Okay. And they've approved the recommendation of the award. And it went forward. Now what I could do in my spin research, okay, go back to that. Let's see here if I can just do back key. Um, I might want to go to that date. Let's see here. That was um, July 21st. What I would do is I would go to the July 21st meeting and look at the download, the packet. Okay. And in the packet, what you're going to find is the responses to those RFPs most likely or at least the winning response. And I'm gonna use that as the fire protection I talked about. And this is gonna be a large document. So I have to do a little bit of research, a water agreement. Let's see, I forget what that was, title was. I might could just do a random keyword search too, okay? But there's the aging contract, let's see. So they're going to talk about all the details, funding budgets, pros, you know, details there. And this is where we're going to find really the good stuff. Okay. So, you know, as I showed you earlier, that one slide, sometimes it looks like hard work, uh, but it pays off. Okay. When you do that. So I want to thank you for coming today. I'm going to check in one last, see so if there's one more questions or not. Yeah, I'm getting some questions. I'll stay here as long as you ask questions. Let me look and see. How can I get the recording? This recording, this is a recording. We're going to put it in our GovSchool. See, it takes about an hour and a half. So when you go to govschool.com, look at under the library. Okay, you go there. Over to the right, there's a tab. Freely available to you. And we'll, we'll set it up as a YouTube, okay? And it'll be under our um, local lessons section. This is what decision making. This is what I talked about earlier, helping you understand how to how governments actually make decisions. Typically, YouTube's um, in our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to, and then you can. It's freely available. They're usually about forty minutes in length. Okay. And sometimes we use interns to do these sessions for us. Other times, uh, our staff would do it. And this is one that I do. I have a little book that I've written about it. Any final questions? I thank you for your time. If you're not linked in with me, feel free to link in with me. Um, you can always come at LinkedIn.com and you can ask me questions. Um, my, my background's there and I'll be glad to answer questions. I get questions routine, routinely here and I'll be glad to try to help you if I can. And we're at, I'm at GovDirections on LinkedIn. Thank you and have a great day.